Okay, so here is a typical Viz workflow for somebody who designs in AutoCAD and Revit. And, you know, the actual design you're going to do in AutoCAD or Revit, and that's where, you know, your creativity comes in. Then you're going to export it to 3ds Max Design, and then you've got to clean it up and add the entourage. Now, the entourage you're not necessarily going to design, right? You're not selling chairs or cars or trees or whatever. You're going to just grab that from some place or use something that you use over and over again and throw that in. Does everybody know what entourage is? If you know what entourage is, raise your hand. How about that? And that's pretty much everybody. There's a few people who don't. Entourage is the extra stuff that you add to your scene to enhance your design. So if you're, you're doing an exterior visualization of a building, for example, uh, you might want to put cars in front of it, trees, stop signs, that kind of stuff. So it's all that extra stuff that isn't the stuff you design, but that's going to enhance your visualization. All right, so you clean it up in 3ds Max design because, of course, it never comes in perfectly, right? Um, and then you add some entourage elements somehow or another. Then you add lights, fix up the textures. If you're going to add some animation, even if it's just an animated camera. And then you render it, and then you deliver it to the client, right? And it goes exactly like this every time, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Next, please. Okay. Often there's this part in here. You clean up, you fix it, you render, and you go, ooh. So you go back and you do it again, and again, and again, and it kind of looks like that. Is anybody here familiar with this idea? Or you, it's not you, you know somebody that it happened to, maybe, something like that. Okay, so uh, that makes you feel very not happy. So what we're gonna be talking about in this presentation is that step right there, getting that part of the workflow to be faster, easier, not so frustrating. And then we will end up with, that's you, here at the end with the delivery. And, you know, making money or making your boss happy or whatever part of it is that getting this done and delivering it, whatever that does for you. So that's what we're doing today. Okay. All right. So this make good viz button. Does anybody know where this is? It's Staples, yes. Uh, <laughs> I wish I knew where this button was. Um, I have heard various times that something like this is coming soon. Um, I started out using Autoflix in 1992, and we were told that it was coming soon then. So I'm not holding my breath for this wonderful button, but wouldn't it be nice if this existed? So we're not gonna, we're not gonna wait for this. We're going to make our own button and make it happen. But you know, I feel like putting up an ad and, someplace Craigslist saying you could buy this for $49.95 selling those and probably do very well for myself okay so what we're asking today is what makes a good 3ds max design scene because if you get a good scene then it's going to be easy to light texture and animate it's going to render nicely and it will be easy to fix any problems that come up along the way or correct things if the client says no I don't want brick anymore I want stucco or no you know whatever changes they make you will be able to edit the scene quickly and easily and get a nice result so let's like take a look at what makes a good 3ds max scene something where everything is at the correct scale have you ever had the um, experience of importing something and the, the parking meter is this big and the car is this big. I think everybody has had that experience, yeah. Um, from what I understand, Revit automatically brings things in at the wrong scale unless you set things a certain way. So it's, it's never fun when that happens. Um, you want something that's easy to edit and retexture, as I discussed, because there will be changes. It, I don't, has anybody here ever had something where the client said they wanted something and you did it and you gave it to them and they said thank you and that's the last you ever heard of it? If, if, anybody, if I would like you to come up here so everybody can clap for you if anybody has ever had that experience. <laughs> we have, yeah, you've had that experience? Really? That's wonderful. Oh, and they never came back again. Oh. <laughs> All right, that's the other side of that coin. Okay. All right. Um, you also want a scene that's well organized. You want all the objects to be named so you can find them again. You want things in layers or in 3ds Max design you have a bunch of different ways to organize stuff. You can have layers, uh, groups, 
selection sets, a number of things. You're probably all more comfortable working with layers from what I understand from AutoCAD and Revit users, but we have a lot of that stuff. And it looks good when rendered. This is quite possibly the most important thing. Like you could almost forgive all this other stuff if it looks good when it's rendered. So we're going to look at, first of all, did it go? Oh, there we go. Looks good when rendered. Okay. Yes. Next one. All right. But what looking good when rendered comes back to being easy to edit and retexture because it's never going to be perfect the first time you do it. Even the most expert user can't make the very first rendering look great. You're going to have test renders. You're going to have to try it over and over again. So you want something that's easy to edit. And that's where picking good entourage and cleaning up your imported models comes in where it's going to be easy to change stuff. All right, so cleaning up your model. Um, I like to think that there are two different steps to cleaning up your model. There is your legitimate cleanup. Now, think of it this way, right? You have a friend who's coming to visit. It's going to stay at your house for a few days, and you haven't really been too good about the cleaning. So um, what you do is you run around, and you, uh, you know, clean the, the rooms they're most likely to use. You clean the bathroom and the kitchen and the bedroom they're staying in. So this is the, the equivalent of tidying up the geometry, organizing your scene, um, fixing up your mapping if you need to. Now, after you've been cleaning up for a little bit, all of a sudden you realize your friend is going to be here in an hour. So the next thing you do is you, you start cheating, which is fine. This is a perfectly legitimate visualization technique. So you, know, you might take stuff and throw it in boxes and shove it in the closet and say, oh, cleaned up. You know, that's what you would do if your friend was coming. But the equivalent with visualization is there's a lot of tricks you can use so that you don't end up spending a lot of time um, making something that your client might not even like or that you're not that familiar with and you, you spend a lot of time lighting this little thing and then in the end the client changes the camera angle so that thing is about this big in the scene. You, know, you don't want to do that. So you want to cheat a lot of stuff in the beginning. And then, once you know what's actually going to be in the scene, then you spend your fiddly-diddly time you know, making all that perfect. OK, let's go on to the next one. All right, cleaning up. A lot of this stuff I'm sure some you are familiar with. We're just going to go through it real quick for those who aren't. Um, one of the problems that you will get when you import from AutoCAD or Revit is you get coincident faces, faces right on top of each other, um, faces that are even share the same set of vertices, uh, faces that are flipped meaning they're backwards or they're just missing altogether. And you, I don't think you could see this very well, but this is a sort of a car thing that has half of the faces are flipped the wrong way. So you can kind of tell what it is, but you kind of can't. That's a sign that the faces have been flipped the wrong way. Now, in 3ds Max design, you have this lovely magic bullet called XView, which came out with 3ds Max 2010. And you just pull that up, and you can check for overlapping faces. You can use the face orientation one up there at the top to look for flipped faces. You can look for overlapping vertices, isolated vertices that end up out in space. And this selects, it detects them, and it will select them for you. So it'll turn them red in the scene, and you can go and address it. Um, and this is probably the number one frustration, I think, with importing models, is that the, depending on the method that you use to create them, to create the, the actual object, the faces might be flipped. All of them might be flipped, or some of them. Another thing is uh, checking out the normals. Now, the normal, a normal is an imaginary arrow that points out of a face that tells the software which way is out. So it only renders the out, and it doesn't try to render the inside. Um, and if you're having trouble with normals, there's the normal modifier, which you can apply. It only works on editable mesh, though, not on editable poly, so you have to convert things. And this will unify or flip your normals. So between XView and the normal modifier, you can clean up a lot of stuff. And there are also a lot of free scripts out there that you can use to clean things up as well. Oh, before I go any further, I meant to, to say that um, after John Cleese's talk last night, I got very inspired, and I updated my presentation. I didn't yet update the handout. So I apologize if you download. Looks like, did anybody bring the handout with them? A couple people, good, not too many. All right, so I'm going to put up, I, I, I couldn't upload the new handout before my presentation here, but I will put it up in the next couple of days. And everybody who came in, um, I'm going to be able to send you a, a message that says there's, the handout is up there. So if you want to just wait for the handout, that's fine. If you want to take notes, that's fine. But I wanted you to know that. OK. All right, so next thing is fixing scale. 
So if something comes in at the wrong scale, um, 3ds Max Design has that select and scale button, right? It's very tempting to just click that and scale things. But if you do that, it scales the object um, at what we call at the object level, not at the sub-object level. And that weird scale, like say you scale something down to 79% of its native size. That number sticks with this thing. And internally, 3ds Max Design is constantly saying, oh, this thing is small. This thing is smaller than it actually is. This thing is small. And it, and it applies different kinds of changes to that object in a weird order that cause strange things to happen. Without getting terribly technical about it, you can look on the internet and Google this and find out exactly the technical reason behind this. But if you scale something and then you link it to something else and then you animate it, it will go all wonky. Also, if you mirror something, it actually has a scale of minus 100%, which, as you can imagine, as um, you know, engineers and architects, this is like not a, it's just not good <laughs> to have that piece of information stuck to this item. So what you want to do is go to your vertex or edge or polygon sub-object level, select the object, scale it there, and then go back to your object level. And that, that has absolutely no bad side effects. This is the best way to scale something so that you won't have problems later. All right, so scripts for cleanup. There is this wonderful site called ScriptSpot that has free scripts. And if you do a search on CAD Cleaner or Revit Cleaner, you get all kinds of scripts in there that will do some of the things that we just talked about and a bunch of other stuff. And if you are into using MacScript at all, which is a wonderfully easy language to use, it's built into 3ds Max Design, based on C++. And you can do a lot of stuff with that. Um, also, uh, at TurboSquid, there are these tools that will check for a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. OK, I think we can go to the next slide here. All right, topology. It's word topology. When uh, 3D modelers talk about topology, they're not talking about you know, surveys of mountains and things like that. This is a completely different kind of thing. So what we're looking at is, next slide, yeah. okay. It's the structure or flow of the wireframe of the model. That's what we mean when we say topology. If you hear a couple of 3D modelers hanging out, talking, and I keep tripping on this thing, like dancing. Um, you know, they'll start talking about topology and they'll say topo, you know. And if something has bad topology, they'll talk about retopologizing it or retopoing it. So if you ever hear this expression, this guy's saying, ah, the topo isn't that good, I'm going to retopo. This is what they're talking about the structure or flow of the wireframe, which has a very big impact on how easy it is to edit and how good it looks in the rendering. So good topology renders as expected, is easy to change. And bad topology, you end, that's where you end up your, with your rendering artifacts. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a situation where you render something and you've got these weird looking triangles on the side of a building or something like that. That's, um, that's because there's a big edge down the middle of this thing. And for whatever reason, the renderer is having trouble figuring that out. So, what you want for good topology is you want mostly quad polygons. You want square polygons, not triangular ones, with a nice, even grid arrangement. This tends to render a lot better than something with long, thin triangles. And uh, edge loops holding edges and not too much detail, which we'll get to in the next couple of slides. All right, so non-quads. You see here, this was made. This is an older model. By the way, this is a lot of stuff from TurboSquid. We sell 3D models there. That's where I'm from. Um, so a lot of the older models up there look like this. And this was perfectly fine 10 years ago. This was actually great. But we're getting a little pickier because new renderers, uh, you know, V-Ray is very picky about this kind of thing. And all, a lot of the new renderers won't handle this kind of thing very well. But you see you have this big slashy edges going right through the middle of this. This could give you a problem, especially if you're doing uh, moving the camera past it. You might get flickering where it can't figure out what color to make the, the frame. Um, so, and they're also hard to edit and texture um, because you're working basically with this planar thing. Uh, does anybody here do any kind of, do you know how to unwrap UVs? Or is that a mysterious world? OK, a lot of, you know what it is? OK. Basically, you're taking something and laying it out flat and um, 
working with a flat texture and trying to make the, the way the vertices and edges are arranged fit your, your image. With this kind of arrangement, you, you're going to end up with this weird looking thing, whereas if you have a grid, it's a lot easier to, um, to match up the grid with a picture, as you can imagine. Um, Okay, we'll go on to the next one to talk about holding edges in a, in a minute. Okay, so with quads. This is a similar building, but all with quads. So you have these lines running across it. And this might seem counterintuitive because you're saying, wow, there's really a lot more faces on this. But it's actually not that many more, and it's a lot easier to deal with. And you can always get rid of some of the faces if you want to. You can always collapse some of them down and make the object simpler. Um, yeah, most more faces, but so worth it. Please take note of the number of O's in that word. All right, and you're going to get less rendering artifacts. So if you think about it, yeah, you know, you wouldn't want to put 200 of these in your scene. But if you're just trying to stick a church behind the building to show, you know, the, what the neighborhood looks like or something like that, this is fine, and you will save a huge amount of time. Like, imagine that you, you, you render it, and the church that you stuck back there looks weird. You don't want to waste a bunch of time messing with this church that isn't even the main thing. You know, you want to, get on, you want to make your design look great. So something like this, you plop it in, it's fine. You never have to worry about it again. That's why it's worth it. OK, edge loops. Now, what edge loops are is it's a way of arranging the edges on a model so that things follow a flow. You end up with, you can click one edge, and in 3ds Max Design, there's a loop button as your selection tools, and it will select the whole loop of edges. And the nice thing about that is that suppose you want to add a little lip to something, or you want to, you know, compress it or something like this. It's really easy to select this long row of edges and use something like the chamfer tool or the bevel or something and just add some little bit to it. If you don't have edge loops, it's really, really hard to do that. So this is why this is considered better topology. It's just easier to select. This is selecting, this is a ring selection is what it's called, where you select one and it selects all the rings going down. With this, you could add another set of edges that connects those rings so you could add extra detail easily. And this is one of the big purposes of having nice edge loops, is it just makes it so easy to select parts of the model and edit them. This is a huge thing with that. Did we want to talk about questions? We should have. OK. Um, my lovely assistant here, Adele, um, she's a social media genius from TurboScript. <laughs> And we, were, we were, had arranged this ahead of time, but then I got all excited and got started, that uh, if you have questions and you want to tweet them to us, what would they tweet? Which hashtag? TurboSquid? At TurboSquid. And at the end, I will take the questions and answer them. But so far, everybody seems, I don't see anybody who looks real confused yet, which is good. OK. All right, next. OK, holding edges. Um, Holding edges are kind of quite a new thing, I guess, in the last five or ten years in terms of their importance in 3D modeling. Um, can we pull up that, the ship? Okay, what holding edges do... All right, so I'm looking for the subdivision level 01. You can just scroll down until we can see the, the letters. There we go. All right, so here we have this ship, right? Very nice ship. Actually, let's show a rendering real quick, so they, the one of the rendered thumbnails, so they can see how pretty it is. All right, this is what the ship looks like. Very nice model, right? Now, back to the subdivision level zero. So the way that this is constructed, there is a little more. <laughs> there's a little more detail than you would think would be necessary on this ship. There we go. Like, there's some extra rows of lines, edges here. And um, on that sort of bulkhead up there, there's, an, do you see what I'm talking about? There's extra rows of edges. Can you point that out, Adele? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, up, up a little bit. There's like a bulkhead, yeah, right there, around that area, that bulkhead that's um, got the lines across. So there's extra detail there defining that that 
if you were using this as like a really low res game model, or this was going to be this big in the scene, way, way in the back, you wouldn't need that level of detail. But the nice thing about those edges being there, if you, can you go to the next picture here on this one? Is that when you apply Turbo Smooth or Mesh Smooth, which is a subdivision, it smooths it out and adds more edges without losing the shape of the object. Have you ever applied Turbo Smooth or Mesh Smooth to something thinking you're going to make it nice and it goes, right? Okay. This is why, because it doesn't have holding edges. So this was, can we go back to zero, please? This was carefully constructed so that if this is going to be in the background, and it's not, you're not going to see it up close, it has a reasonable number of polygons. It's not going to kill your scene. But subdivision level one, if you want to get a little bit closer, Del, can I have the next one? If you want to get a little bit closer, you have a smoother, you'll be able to get more of a close-up on this just by adding subdivision to it, which is going to like double the number of faces. But if you're going to be that close to it, you want it to be that smooth. And your other models that you don't need to show that in that much detail can just keep no subdivision, can just be at their low level of faces and can be at the back of the scene. So this is a huge thing. See if there's a level two. I think the next one is subdivision level two. You can go even smoother with just the next image. Yeah. There we go. You can go even smoother with this. So the reason that this is great is because you know how clients are. They change their mind. They get creative. And you're sitting down showing them what you've done, and they go, well, how about if we put the camera over here? And you go, oh, great. That's where I put all the crappy stuff <laughs> it's back in the back of the scene. Well, with this, it doesn't matter if the camera goes over there. You just un you take Turbo Smooth off, off all the stuff that's far from the camera and apply it to all the stuff that's close to the camera. And this way, you can manage the levels of detail in your scene without having to swap out models. It's just very simple. So. Um, holding edges, though, are what make this possible. You need an extra row of edges. Like, see that bulkhead? The edge of that bulkhead stays nice and sharp because it has those extra edges around there. If we pop back to level zero, subdivision level zero, we can see that's what holds it there. Is there's three sets of edges there. And that holds that in place so when you apply Turbo Smooth, it doesn't fall apart. Okay. So back to our PowerPoint presentation. All right, next slide. OK, bad topology, bad topology. All right, n-gons. N-gons are polygons that have uh, more than four sides. So we talked about quads being the ideal. An n-gon has five, six, seven sides, more sides. Um, they do not respond well to subdivision. They tend to turn into these weird star patterns that look weird when they're rendered and they're just harder to edit. Um, excessive numbers of triangles. This is the kind of image, that, the kind of uh, topology that you're going to get when you do a 3D scan of something. So this is fine. It's not, you, you cannot edit this thing. But you know, say you have some little statue or bust or something, and you want to scan it, and you're going to start using it in your scenes. That's fine. Just don't ever try to edit it, because it will be impossible. Um, so this type of topology is pretty much acceptable on statuary and stuff like that that's been 3D scanned. That's OK. But yeah, again, it's not considered good topology, to be sure. Um, on this house up here, we have uh, the kind of topology I had talked about, where you just have some weird edge hanging around in space somewhere. That's not going to be good. And look at that roof. Look at the grid of that roof. Like, it's a bit overkill for a flat roof, don't you think? Um, one of the things that marks out good topology, too, is you don't have any unnecessary detail. If something is a flat box, it's just a flat box. That's all it is. You don't have to have a bunch of grid lines on it. Unless you have rounded corners, which you want to keep nice and round so you can subdivide and get a nice close-up of your beveled edge, then you're going to need holding edges around the edge. But you don't need to have this kind of grid on the roof. That was, that's just laziness, or it's an old model, one or the other. All right, so this is a messy scan here of a statue. You can kind of see what it looks like over here. But this is just very tight with triangles. Just in the last six months, there are these new retopologization re tools. Say that 10 times fast. 
um, that will take something like this and convert it to something like this with a nice, clean grid on it. Um, they're a little, from what I understand, they're a little bit finicky, but they do work, and they're, they're included in Mudbox and ZBrush. And also, another piece of software called 3D Coat has re, Retopo, I'm just going to say Retopo, Retopo tools. Um, so if you absolutely do need to change the topology to something like this, like say you're going to, if you're going to, going to animate this statue, it's going to bend in the wind or it's going to jump around. You need to have it like this if you're going to animate it. It is almost impossible to animate something like that. Effectively, it looks awful. Um, and also, the, re the Retopo tools do a really good job of retaining the textures on something, which is great. It automatically maps it for you. All right, choosing your entourage. Okay, so there's lots of places to get entourage. You're probably familiar with some of these. Um, there's places you can get free downloads. Does anybody here use Revit City? Yeah, you know, it, everybody's like, yeah. Um, you know, Revit City, it's like, it's like, um, I don't know, you, you, you use it and then you're like, I'm never doing that again, that was awful. And then three months later, you're like, oh, I think I'll go back to Revit City. It wasn't so bad. And yeah, it's like a hangover. You forget how bad it was, you know? Um, but yeah, have you ever spent like two hours trying to fix a Revit City family? Yeah. Um, just a piece of advice on that. Go ahead and download the free stuff from Revit City, but if you can't fix it in two minutes, Skip it and make it new in 3ds Max Design and use the thing that you downloaded as reference for the size and shape and proportion of stuff. Because that window frame that you downloaded, that every time you change the parameter to open the window and the thing falls apart, it's going to take you about 10 minutes to remake that window in 3ds Max Design. All right. Uh, Seek has a lot of manufacturer stuff. I don't know if you've been to, this is a seek.autodesk.com. I think I have that up. You want to pull that up? Um, they're trying to get more and more manufacturer stuff up there. Uh, one of the things to be aware of with Seek, though, is that you know something that's, that was made to give you BIM information is not necessarily going to be the best entourage um, item. You know, it might be very heavy with all this information, or it might have too much detail, or not enough detail, or whatever. So, um, you know, make. Use your judgment, I guess, is the best thing. And again, you can always import something, and if the, t the topology is a big, fat mess, like uh, let's say something like this. You import something like this, and it's just a mass of triangles, and you say, yeah, but it's the perfect shape, and maybe I won't have to edit it, I don't know. If you do have to edit it, just model another one on top of it. Use this for reference, but you can use cylinders in 3ds Max Design and make this nice, clean strainer that you can edit, you know, or you can make it low res, then you can apply subdivision to it. There's a lot you can do. So I end up doing that fairly often is, um, oh, I've been using 123D, um, um, what's the one where he takes photos and makes a model? Catch. I've been using 123D Catch. Has anybody used that for anything? Taking some photos? A few people. You take photos of something like here. May I? You could sit this down and take photos of this from all around, and then you plop it into 1 to 3D Catch, and it pops out a model. Now, the topology on the model looks like that statue that I showed you. It's a mess. But you have the proportions at that point. And it's particularly useful if you're modeling something you're not real familiar with. Like, do you ever try to model a car and you're just not familiar with how cars look and you model it and it looks like a bad toy, like some, a reject from Toys R Us? You know, but if you have something out of 1, 2, 3D catch, you can at least get the proportions right, make a reasonable model of it. So there is no shame in uh, using the real thing for reference. Okay, back to here. Um, Google Warehouse also has free models. But again, anything that's free, you kind of get what you pay for. It's just the, the way it works. Um, the four pay models, of course, being from TurboSquid. Um, I've got to talk a little bit about that. Can you pull that up? We have a lot of different kinds of models of every shape and size. And we have a, um, a certification program called Checkmate Pro, where um, if something is fully subdividable, and they show those subdivision thumbnails that I was showing you, they get a special badge 
So this stuff is priced a little bit higher, but at least, you know, if, if, you, if you need something and you know it has to be perfect, it's a good idea to, to get something like that. But we also have a lot of free stuff, and you can always download all the free stuff and just stub it in to show, you know, for your previs. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're going to put the tables and chairs there, and just, just to get your, uh, you know, your um, blocking out of your scene. And then later, replace it with good stuff either that you create yourself or that you find somewhere or from the manufacturer's website and so on. So we have a lot of free stuff. How about furniture? Free furniture. <laughs> free. <laughs> free keyword. It's funny. All right. So back to, the, to this. All right. Now, instead of using models, you can use planar cutouts, which is one of my favorite cheats. Remember I said I'd tell you how to cheat? This is like awesome cheating. Okay, next slide, please. So, you take regular old photos. Those photos up there are photos that I actually took back when I was living up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On the right is some random guy in a green hat who happened to walk by me, and I took his photo. Um, you can't really tell what he looks like, and uh, so I decided that was okay, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. So I took that and a tree and a few other things, and I brought them into Photoshop, and I just kind of painted out the background, cleaned it up a little bit, and I put an alpha channel on it. If you don't know what an alpha channel is, it's, you can look this up in Photoshop. It's easy to make. And then I had this 3D scene down here, and this guy is just mapped onto a plane, and there he is, and there's my car on a plane, and a tree on a plane, and so on. So it's a really quick way to just get some stuff into the scene, just slap it in. And you can also constrain these planes, so they always face the camera. So if you're sitting there trying to figure out what the camera angle should be, you can move the camera around and the planes will always face it. Now, if you move the camera around too much, this guy's going to be like walking off, and, but it doesn't matter. You know, you can always fix it later, change it to a different photo. So this is very quick, very cheap, and um, it works for a lot of stuff, especially if the things that you're putting in are going to be very tiny. Now, having said that, I did take a picture of this guy without his permission. I actually have never met him. It was about, I took that picture five years ago. I have no idea who he is or where he is, but he has not come after me for his share of the profit for <laughs> this image, which is that. I probably owe him about $5, I think. Um, but he's not recognizable. I, I changed the color of the hat, too. So, you know, he's not recognizable. You wouldn't know who he is, so I feel comfortable using this photo. Now, having said that, um, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so um, I read up on the rules of what kinds of photos you could use or, um, what, you know, photos of people and cars and so on, and I feel comfortable with a certain level of comfort of using photos of cars and people and trees and stuff like that. But you really should do your own research. I have to put this disclaimer up here because if you leave my seminar and you take a photo of somebody and use it and then you get sued, you, you, you can't sue me. Okay, got it. All right, good. Okay, next slide. Okay, scene organization. Let's talk a little bit about that. How are we for time? What time is it? 2 4. Okay, good. All right, scene organization. All right, so you want to make sure that your scene is organized nice and tidy. Uh, you want to have your objects named. Now, of course, when you create stuff in any program, actually, it gives it a name. And in 3ds Max Design, you have box 01, box 02, box 257, box 3492. Anybody ever opened someone else's scene that had 500 boxes in it, all named box? Yeah, didn't you love that? Wasn't that great? Yeah. Um, don't do this to your coworkers. Um, it's, there's renaming tools within 3ds Max Design. There's a rename tool under the Tools menu. Uh, you can add prefix, prefixes to things. Um, a lot of designers uh, that, that I've uh, talked to like to organize by material. So they'll take all the glass, for example, name it all, glass one, glass two, glass three, or whatever, or they might name it after the building that it's on or something like this, and they'll put it all in one layer. Because if you're going to change the glass, you're probably going to be changing all of it at once. And the same with all metal and this kind of thing. So that, that works out pretty well for them. Um, so you could organize your layers by material or by object type. And also, another important thing is to position your scene or your objects near the origin. 
in um, 3ds Max Design, you have a grid, right? And there's a zero, zero, zero point. Have you ever merged something in the scene and you're like, where did it go? So you merge it again and you're like, is it, is it like an unexploded block or something? It's just disappeared. It's not here. So you, you, know, you merge it like five times and then you find it out in deep space in your scene. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like you do a zoom extents all and there's your scene and there's that, those five things that you've imported. So especially if you're making something that someone else is going to import, put it near 000. At least they'll be able to find it if they import it. And the same for your scene, too. People won't have trouble finding your stuff when they open up your scene. Be, be kind to your coworkers and to yourself. Because you know how it is. Two months later, you're going to open up this scene, and you're going to remember anything <laughs> about it. So it's almost like writing a note to yourself. OK, next. All right, let's talk a little bit about tailored workflows. Um, all right, so you have some different types of clients here. Um, where you know you have newbies, right? People that have never had any visualization done. Have you ever shown something to them and they're like, "Why is it all gray?" Did you ever have that happen? <laughs> and um, you know, how come it looks like that? And it's um, you know they're not familiar with how um, the viz process. And then you might have somebody that's very experienced who. Um, you know, they're, they're happy to sit down with you and go and pick out the entourage, for example. They might send you the entourage to look in the scene, those are to use in the scene. And those are wonderful clients to have because they help you do your job better and you know they're getting exactly what they want. Um, so a couple of different workflows that you could, you could look at using is for a new un uneducated client, use those planes with the people you know, the people in the cars and stuff stuck on them because those are really easy to change. And they have all the full information in there. It's not like you've got some little, you know, boxy uh, 3D guy. You know, using 3D people that are animated to walk, that's fine, but you have to be prepared to take the time to make it look half decent. Um, and if you get an uneducated client and you have some little 3D guy that's just kind of moving across the floor like this, they're going to go, why is that guy doing that? <laughs> you know? So you don't want to show that. You want to show some very nice looking fellow walking along or looking at his watch or whatever. And if they say, well, it's not animated, it's like, yeah, we haven't animated it yet. Animate it later after they approve the camera angles and they, you know, you say, okay, everything down to like all these people are going to be wearing business suits in this part of the scene. And they're like, okay, good. Good, you got that? And all you had to do was use photos. You can even take photos of the people in your office. You can use the same photos over and over again for that test part. Now, if they don't want you to use the same people that you used in somebody else's uh, project, that's fine. But for your initial approval, you can just use the same stuff that you have, and it's very easy to work with that way. A more savvy client, you could stub in some free or cheap 3D models, and you work with them interactively to get the camera angles. And they will understand if they suddenly move the camera over here and you have something that looks very boxy and they say, is that going to work for close-up? It's like, yeah, we'll just get something that's subdividable and we'll work with that. And they'll be like, okay, you know, if they're savvy about it. The newbie client would probably wouldn't understand that. So it's just a couple of possible sample workflows for what you're working with that would, that would speed things up. Um, and I think that's just a slide I forgot to delete. <laughs> there we go. All right. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit. Everybody still with me? Then if the guy next to you is asleep, just okay. no, we're good. Okay, I think everybody's awake. All right. Had a good lunch, huh? Wasn't that good? I know they feed you so well here. All right. Um, at TurboSquid, we have this standard called Checkmate Pro. Um, and a little history behind this. First of all, I'm not trying to sell you anything. This is all free. Okay, this is free. So don't, don't put on your, your don't sell me anything blinders. It's free. Um, you know, we sell 3D models at TurboSquid, and we don't make anything at there. People all around the world make this stuff and put it up for sale. It's like stock photography. You know, iStock doesn't take photos. And they might take a few, but it's really all the photographers around the world putting this stuff up for sale. So. We have artists all over the world, what, 30,000, 35,000 artists that make stuff and put it up for sale. And when something sells, they get, uh, we, we kind of basically split the money. So um, 
a few years ago, like say, I don't know, 2008, 2009, people started to complain a little bit, our customers. They're like, this is not to scale. I imported it in my scene and the scale was wrong. Um, I opened it up and the topology was a big mess, you know? And up until that point, TurboSquid was founded in 2000. And up until that point, we let people put up whatever they wanted. You could make a big, you can make a cube and pack it up into pieces and put that up for sale and we didn't care, you know. It's, artists were just creating stuff and that was fine. But then it's, customers started to get more picky and we felt like we needed to step in a little bit and advise the artists on how to make stuff to satisfy the customers. So we surveyed the customers and this, they came up with the stuff that I've been talking about here, it's like no coincident or overlapping faces, no isolated vertices. We want nice mapping. We want quads. We, you know, we want it to be easy to edit. And it was an interesting um, point that this also fits in with what works best with visualization. I mean, this was global across the boards. So this was film, games, people working in broadcast, and people working in archvis, which, and also in, in engineering or product design and that kind of stuff. Everybody wanted those things. So we said, okay, if everybody wants this stuff, we're going to make it into a standard and people can make models to the standard and if they pass the standard, then they get a little badge. A little badge like this. So customers will know that the model has been checked. Now we have over 300,000 models at TurboSquid. We have not checked all of them. <laughs> we're up to what, 15,000 or so? What's about that? 20,000? Okay. So as an artist makes a new model, they submit it for this certification. And we have guys that sit there and, and look at these models and check them out. But they also use these scripts to check the models. So we made these available because they're, you know, they're checking for all the stuff we've talked about here. Now anybody can go and download these and use them to check their own models for that. So. Um, that was one of the things that we wanted to, we just want everybody's models to be better. We really do. Because if everybody's models are better, it improves the entire industry. And we're kind of like Kleenex, you know, or Hallmark, you know about that? They, um, any a company that makes greeting cards, if they're not Hallmark, they don't advertise because if they advertise, all it does is make people want to go buy more greeting cards, not necessarily theirs but all greeting cards. And Hallmark sells more greeting cards than anybody. So if you have a little greeting card company and you advertise, all you're doing is increasing Hallmark, Hallmark's sales. Does that make sense? Same with Kleenex. You know, when was the last time you saw an ad for a facial tissue that was not Kleenex? Because they would never do it, because that improves Kleenex's sales. So we're kind of like that. They, you know, we're the biggest in the industry, so anytime there's more 3D modeling going on and the 3D modeling is better, it's better for us, but it's just better all around. It makes it, people's scenes look better. Um, it gets more respect for the entire industry, and that's one of the reasons we stepped up and did this. Um, so we also needed to train our artists on how to meet the standards. So we have tons of YouTube videos. Can we pull up the help? We have YouTube videos, we have blog articles, um, we have all kinds of stuff. Uh, there it is. Okay, and this is the actual standard on, in our support, our support section, which you can, is free to go to. You don't even have to have a TurboSquid member, um, membership. The tools, downloading the scripts, you have to be a TurboSquid member, but it's free. All we ask for is an email address. Um, so you can, for example, if you have an artist who's creating entourage for you, and they're giving you crappy stuff, you can send them here and say, here, meet this. And your life will get a lot easier. So we're happy for this standard to be adopted by any and every uh, industry or company or whatever. And if you come up with something that you think should be in the standard, you can send it to us and we will actually listen to you because we, we want this to be great. This is not something we thought about of our heads. This is something that our, our customers told us and people in the industry told us. Okay, so what's my next thing that I'm going to blab about here? Scripts. Oh, it's the end. Okay, so yeah, we have the scripts, we have the training materials. Um, can you pull up our blog, too, please? And uh, we have some great articles here. If you do a search on um, Edge Flow, Edge Flow is, that's the thing I was, Edge Loops and Edge Flow. Edge Flow, Edge Loops. Um, no, 
the uh, subdivision topology requirements, I think, is the one. No, it's already there. It's up. It's right next to you. There you go. Cursor. No. It's that one. Yeah. Okay. So scroll down. So um, this goes over some of the, you know, when we talk about how you like to have a grid arrangement, you want nice clean edge flow. This has a lot of examples. And we have a lot of blog posts about this that every time our artists were confused and they'd say, how am I supposed to fix this? And I don't know what to do. If there was, you know, if two of them asked about it, we would write a blog post about it or put something in our knowledge. So we pretty much, we covered a lot of different scenarios and situations for making good edge flow and making good models. Um, some of the artists have fought us on this because we're, um, we're stifling their creativity or some such and I don't know. If you've ever run into that, maybe not. It looks like you guys don't. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we just tell them, look, do you want to sell more? Do you want more people to enjoy using your models and to use them in more and different ways? Then you really need to do this. Um, it, it's kind of like, I don't know, you designed a building and the construction guy is going to come build it. And you say, look, I want you to put these kinds of supports in here because it's going to support the load that we need. And he says, well, no because I'm creative and I'm going to do it differently, you know, be kind of like that, which, yeah, it's fun. It doesn't make sense? Okay. All right. I like analogies. Sometimes they don't work, but they're always fun anyway. Okay. So that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you about today. Um, has anybody tweeted any questions? Not a single tweet. Would someone prefer to do it the old fashioned way and raise their hand and ask a question? No. It was all crystal clear. It made total sense. It's amazing. No way. That cannot possibly what be. What percentage of our downloads are free versus paid? There's more free than paid. That's for sure. Um, hmm? Yeah, the free. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of free stuff downloaded for that initial visualization phase. Also, a lot of students, and they're trying to put together some kind of student project. They have no money. Um, so yeah, more free than paid. But you know, what's that? Yeah, we make more money from the paid stuff than the free stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What's the story behind the name Turbo Squid? Okay, well, as I said, the company was founded in 2000, and in 1999, uh, the couple of the guys that were founding the company were sitting around trying to think of a name, and they came up with the idea of, well, first of all, they were going to call it something like Digital Media Exchange, something very serious. But all the good URLs were already taken. So somebody had this idea of a squid with tentacles reaching out to the whole world, and back in 1999, Turbo was uh, hot subject. So they went with Turbo Squid and they surveyed it on about a dozen people. And of all the people they asked, it was something like um, most people liked it, one person hated it, and two of them didn't care. But even the one guy who hated it, a week later he still remembered the name. So that's when they felt they had a winner. Not very. We should come up with a better story. Someone was deep sea diving. Giant squid. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Would I, how would I characterize issues with Google Warehouse files? They're very basic. It's like a very low number of polygons. Um, they may or may not have materials on them. And then no, certainly not textures. They might just have colors thrown on them. So they're really good for just real basic blocking. But, you know, you're not, I wouldn't use a Google Warehouse uh, model in a final rendering unless it really was this big in a rendering this big. You know, if you're looking for, you know, you need a fire hydrant and it's going to be like out in distance, okay, fine. But other than that, no. But fine for the stubbing in the beginning, just to get client approval for sure. 
There's another one over here. Yes. Okay. Uh, the question was, there was an issue with bringing Revit models into 3ds Max design uh, with regard to scale. Um, this is something that a, a couple of my Revit user friends have told me. I've never actually tried this. I've never had a problem with this, but they said that if the unit scale in Max, in 3ds Max design is not set properly, then when you import stuff, hang on, before you all go, I will be sending you a link to take a survey. and. Um, I, I get a prize if I get really good survey, enough really good surveys. So even if you think I stink, just fill it out anyway, because I'd rather have that than not have enough filled out. Okay, good. So now you all know that. Um, but th there's, if you Google it, there's, there's, there's videos on it and you know, things that tell you when that's a problem and when that's not. Um, when I originally put this together, like if you look at the handout that is up there now, not the final one, I started to put together like things to watch out for in Revit and AutoCAD when you export. But the thing is, it's so um, unpredictable. It's like if you do a sweep in AutoCAD in a certain way, then when the model comes in, it won't will look right. But if you do it a slightly different way, it will be fine. So instead of detailing out every little way that something works or doesn't work. Um, one of the things I've seen people do that works really well is you make a sort of a test dummy scene in AutoCAD or Revit using all the tools that you might reasonably use in a normal project. And you know, to make a box and a donut, you know, and a, just a little of this and a little of that, some columns and this and that, just a dummy scene and export it. And just see what happens when you bring it into 3ds Max Design. Play with that get that down and that's going to be, you'll be 50% of the way there when you have a bigger scene. What you don't want to have is this huge complicated scene. You export it and something is terribly wrong and you don't know why. And it's probably some little thing, it's going to take you forever to find that. You know? So cutting back to a simpler process will help you. And again, look it up on Google, YouTube, it'll explain the whole changing the unit scale and, and that kind of thing. So that'll work. Any more questions? Yes. Does TurboSquid offer to fix models for a price? No. <laughs> um, but you know, we have a big artist community, and some of them might want to. Why well, do you need models fixed sometimes? Oh, if you buy a model at TurboSquid and you can't get it to work, you can contact support, and they will try and contact the artist. And mo I'd say most of the artists are pretty, um, pretty good about responding to that kind of thing and fixing things for you. If it really truly doesn't work, like you open it up and the textures are missing or this, bleh, you can get a refund. Artists don't like that, but they should fix their model then. Okay, we had another question over here. Yes. What types of models on TurboSquid sell the best? People, cars, and architecture. And hands. Yeah, hands. So people, you want to pull up some of our, pull up a gorgeous blonde, and, and the hands too. Uh, people sell extremely well. Cars of any kind. We have been, and I have been, uh, someone came up to me at one of the mixers the other night after having a number of drinks and said, how come you don't have every car? And I'm like, geez, I will get right on that as soon as I finish my cocktail. Um, you know, they just, it's, there's a lot of cars out there. But we have, a, we have cars, we have all these people. Where's a blonde? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I had it set to newest or something. There we go. This is one of our newer models. She sells extremely well. Um, there was another uh, model called Masha that was our best-selling woman for a long time and I saw her on weight loss commercials. I saw her every week on TV. She'd shrink, you know. Um, yeah, she's down near the end. Down in the end. Um, yeah, over on the right. Um, she's one, the 195 one on the end of that row. The end of that row. Yeah, it's Masha. But, you know, even she's looking a little dated. You know, this model is from a few years back. This was published in, just in 2004. 
So things change all the time. People's expectations of realism are, are increasing all the time. Are all the people models rigged was the question and the answer is no. No, but they sell a lot better if they're rigged. But a lot of them are, and they say if they're rigged or not. And the ones that have the little check mark, we have tested the rig, if it has a rig, to make sure it works reasonably well. I mean, obviously, you take a person's leg and put it behind their head, you might get a little miss in here, but if you're just doing normal stuff like walking and sitting, it should be fine. Um, yeah, ours are crazy good. Uh, and um, yeah, we sell a lot of cars and a lot of furniture as well. Furniture is huge. Okay, I think we can move on, Adele. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's the rig. Yeah, it is kind of Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, animals sell really well. Any more? Another question? Did I see another hand go up someplace? Yes? Uh, the question is, is there a restriction on use of the models? Um, there's a basic restriction, but it's probably not uh, restrictive to what you want to do. You can use it as many times you want as, as many, in as many projects as you want. So you can use it for you know, one client and then for another client or the same with, for the same client in different, you know, for a TV commercial and then use it in a print ad and use it for a brochure and use it for just whatever you want. So you can use it many different ways. The only things you can't do are, are you can't resell it. Like you can't make some little change to it, then put it up for sale and say, oh, it's my model, because that's a derivative work. That, that won't fly. Um, you can't, um, actually, do we allow them to put on a t-shirt, sell the t-shirt? I think we, you can do that. So you could do a rendering of it and put the rendering on a t-shirt and sell the t-shirt. That's OK. Um, but it's basically it's just fair, you know, if you read over what the law is and just being basically fair about it. Um, yeah, this is, this is a Checkmate Pro model, right? Yeah, go ahead and show the wireframe on it. So this is an example of a beautiful quad model, very carefully put together. This is an Italian artist that the animals he creates are just, yeah, this is, yeah, he, and he knows how to do fur really well. But these um, models that he creates, whenever another artist starts whining that they can't possibly create this lamp with quads only, we just send him this topology of this ape. Or there's a rabbit, one of Massimo's rabbits, that's unbelievable. And it's like, if this guy can make a gorilla <laughs> out of quads, you can make a lamp out of quads, you know? Um, yeah, so he does these really phenomenal animals. And yeah, they're a little pricey, but um, if somebody's making a TV commercial and they, it's going to save them three days of time for this, um, this thing to be perfectly constructed and perfectly rigged, 300 bucks is nothing. Um, let me look at, somebody asked to see furniture. Furniture is perhaps the biggest bargain at TurboSquid because we have so much of it. Um, we sell a lot of it. But every one of your colleagues that ever made their own furniture, what are you limited by there? Oh, by the artist, by Masm. It's the only furniture he has. Did you, did you turn that one off? Oh, it's thinking, OK. Every one of your colleagues that ever made a piece of furniture that they thought was pretty cool has put it up for sale. <laughs> so we have a lot of furniture, but we sell a lot of it. Um, I wish I could tell you that you could get 200 bucks for a piece of furniture, but most of the time you can't. It tends to sell in the 10, 20, under $50 range, sometimes less. There's, we have a lot of free furniture, too, that is really perfectly good for stubbing into stuff. Some of it might could actually work OK for a final scene, too, but you got to be a little careful about that, because again, you get what you, what you pay for. Uh, another? Oh, they think it's real. This is a big problem we have at Turbo Squid, especially around the holidays. Maybe we should finish off with our, our what do you mean it's not real? Yeah, the image. Um, yeah, people come and they're very excited that we have $15 iPods and $20 iPads. And they order all kinds of stuff. So. Um,
So whenever somebody comes up who's new and looks at a product, now it gives them this message. Um, and people don't read, right? You know, they pull it up and there's wireframes and it's talking about the texture resolution and stuff. They don't read any of that. They, ooh, and they click add to cart. And then they call up three days later and say, or they send an email to our support system and say, there was no place to put my shipping address. Or I would like to order two of these, please. My daughter would like one, too. Um, <laughs> uh, so then we have to give them a refund. And that's very unpleasant for everybody concerned. So this was to avoid that. Um, do you want to show the, the video? OK. Are you looking at oh, the Yin Yang bookshelf? Yeah. Yeah, everybody's buying this thing. Yeah, they get very angry. Okay, well that's about, um, I think this, even though it says 4.30, it's really 2.30. I'm sorry, I'm still on New Orleans time. You wanna pull up? We have a video about people thinking our products is real and it's kind of fun. This is all true, so I thought we might end off with that and thank you very much for coming um, you will be getting a survey again please fill it out even you know good bad or whatever your feedback is always welcome is this loud enough magic with it. He set up the really tables, magic. this really awesome yin-yang bookshelf, yeah, and I, everybody purchases it and everybody. thinks it's real. Sometimes people call in and they, they can't figure out how to buy more than one of them. There was a person who was actually shocked that we were selling people on our website. <laughs> she thought we were selling young girls. Store frames, toy train. Well, there was nowhere for me to put my shipping address. Can I can I give that to you? Great testament to the types of artists that we have. Sometimes the rendering will look video? better it's on than a photograph of the, the real thing. <laughs> the only thing you can <laughs> tell the customer yeah, okay. is understandable that you purchased this item thinking it was real.